Amen. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for your powerful blessing to be upon the preaching of the Word of God. Lord, I pray for our minds to be attentive to the truth of the Scripture. I pray for our hearts to be open. And I pray that we would receive the Word of God as the Word of God and not as the Word of man. I pray for the lost to be saved, for marriages to be strengthened, for the backslidden to be restored, for the hurting to be comforted, for the sick to be healed. And most of all, I pray for Jesus to be honored, lifted up, and for you to be glorified. I pray for your anointing and that you would enable me to preach from the overflow of being filled with your spirit. That we would not see the messenger, but we would hear the message and that we would not look to the preacher, but that we would look beyond the preacher to the one being preached about. And that we would leave here today talking about the glory and the beauty of Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask if you would to open your Bibles this morning to, to uh, Luke's account of the gospel. Our text is going to be in Luke chapter 18. However, we're going to need to start reading in chapter 17 in order to truly appreciate the context of chapter 18. Now, as you're turning your Bibles, let me just begin by just asking you a question. I think it's always good to... Uh, to start a sermon with a question because it helps you to become engaged in the message. Not that you're not already, okay? Is it easier, here, here's a simple question, is it easier to breathe or not to breathe? Which one is, which one is natural f for a living person? Okay, okay, to breathe. So it's natural for a living person to breathe. I mean, I've never experienced a day where at the end of the day where I said, I am so tired of breathing today. Has anybody else ever? No. Now, let's say that instead of doing what is natural, breathing, let's say I, I decided that today I'm going to I'm going to try to hold my breath as long as I can several times. I mean, all day long, I'm just going to try to hold my breath as long as I can. And, and as soon as I get done holding my breath and I can't hold it any longer, I'm going to let it out and then I'm going to start again. And then I'm going to let it out and I'm going to start. So all day long, I'm going to see how long I can hold my breath. Now, do you think at the end of the day, I would say, boy, I am tired today from trying to hold my breath. Would that result in fatigue? Yeah, the reason it results in fatigue, physical f fatigue, is because I'm striving to do something that is unnatural. And that would result in physical fatigue. I believe that there are many Christians today who are struggling with spiritual fatigue. And it's because they're not doing what's natural. As breathing is natural for the human, prayer is natural for the Christian. And there are many Christians today who are holding their breath spiritually concerning prayer. Not praying as we ought to pray results in spiritual fatigue. Does that make sense? I believe personally... That prayerlessness is one of the greatest sins of the church today. I believe that the people of God are not praying. We are not praying as fervently and as persistently as we should. And, and there are many today who are wondering why they can't find power to overcome a stronghold. There's a certain sin in your life. And, and every time you tell yourself you're not going to do it, you're doing it again. And, and we wonder why we are not walking in victory. Or we're not walking in power. We're not, we're not walking, uh, we're not experiencing victory over strongholds. We may ask ourselves, why? 
Well, I would encourage you this morning to look at your prayer life. Look at your prayer life. How do you pray? Many of us have heard the analogy of using Jesus like a spare tire. There are some people, the only time, you know, you put a spare tire in the trunk of your car and the only time you ever visit that spare tire is if you, uh, as if you, uh, if you need it. Other people, their spare tires uh, underneath their vehicle. And that's the inside joke over here, so okay. <laughs> but some people treat Jesus like a spare tire. that You never look at your spare tire until you need it, right? And some people treat Jesus that way. They, they, they're not interested in Jesus until, until a tragedy happens in their life, and then they'll turn to Jesus. Well, some people do the same thing with prayer. And, and many Christians are that way concerning prayer. They, 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 don't, they don't have a daily prayer time, a consistent pattern of persistent prayer. No, really, there are many people in the church today, the only time they pray is when something is going wrong in their life, and then they'll get serious about prayer. Now, I'm not saying that you don't pray every day. You may throw up some shallow prayers. You may, you may whisper something to the Lord. But what I'm talking about is persistent, fervent, passionate prayer Closet time secret prayer where we get on our face before God and seek Him from a pure heart. That's the type of prayer I'm talking about. I'm talking about the type of prayer that results in people's lives being transformed. The type of praying that results in a, in a nation being healed. The, the type of prayer that results in the lost being saved. The type of prayer that, res, that results in a church experiencing revival. And so I want to say to us this morning as a congregation that we need to get back to a place in our walk with Christ where the main thing is kept the main thing and prayer is a priority in our life. Now, with that being said, let's look at John, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 17. Because in verse 18, or chapter 18, Jesus is teaching us about the importance of persistent prayer. The power of persistent prayer is the title of our sermon this morning. But look there at chapter 17 and verse 20. Jesus is talking about the signs of his coming. He says there, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God will come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming with something observable. No one will say, look here or there, for you see the kingdom of God is among you. Then he told his disciples, the days are coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you won't see it. They will say to you, look there or look here. Don't follow or run after them. For as the lightning flashes from the horizon to horizon and lights up the sky, so the Son of Man will be in his day. But he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And there Jesus Christ is alluding to the cross. Verse 26, just as it was in the days of Noah, Jesus says, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People went out eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. It will be the same as it was in the days of Lot. People went out eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building. But on that day, Lot left Sodom. Fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be like that on that day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, a man on his housetop whose belongings are in his house must not come down to get them. Likewise, the man who is in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife? Whoever tries to make his life secure will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two will be in a bed. One will be taken and one will be left. Two men will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and one will be left. Two will be in the field. One will be taken and the other will be left. Where the Lord is, they ask him. Where, or they said, where, Lord? They ask him and he said to them, where the cor corpse is, there the there also the vultures will be gathered. Then he told them the parable on the need for them to pray always and not become discouraged. There was a judge in one town who didn't fear God or respect man. And a widow in that town kept coming to him saying, Give me justice against my adversary. 
For a while he was unwilling, but later he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or respect man, yet because this widow keeps uh, pestering me, I will give her justice so she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay to help them? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find that faith on the earth? What will the Son of Man find you doing when he comes? That's a very important question, isn't it? What will the Son of Man find you doing when he comes? We look at this passage of Scripture, and we started in chapter 17 because I wanted you to see the context of, of chapter 18. Jesus here is teaching about the signs of his coming. Jesus tells them, just like it was in the days of Noah, Noah was taken in the ark, and those who were left experienced judgment. He says, also with Lot, there in Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot was taken out of the city, and those who remained in the city, right, experience the judgment of God. So it will be one day when the Lord returns. The Lord is coming for his church. The church will be taken and those who are left are going to experience the judgment of God. There is a day coming soon and very soon when we are going to see the Lord, right? The return of the Lord Jesus Christ is imminent. It can happen at any moment. And this is a message that, that needs to be preached continuously. We're not waiting on something else to happen. We're not waiting on more prophecy to be fulfilled. Today Christ could come. The moment is right. He said just as it was in the days of Noah. What were people doing in the days of Noah? Well the world was very wicked in the days of Noah. And people were eating and drinking and they were marrying. In other words they were living life like it's no big deal. The world was wicked. But everybody was living life, doing their own thing. Everything in their mind was normal. And all of a sudden, when they didn't expect it, the rain began to fall and the world was flooded. So it was in the days of Lot. Just like in the days of Lot. There they were in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. The city was wicked. The city was depraved. And the people were going about eating and drinking and they were doing what was ever right in their own mind. In their mind, everything was okay until the day when God's judgment came and fire began to fall from heaven and destroyed the city. He says, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, when the world is wicked and the world is depraved and when everybody is doing what is right in their own eyes, the Lord is going to come. Everybody's going to be eating and drinking and they're going to be acting like it's no big deal. But then the Lord is going to come. Friend, we're living in that day when the world is deceitfully wicked and says we have no need of God and everyone is doing right in their own eyes and everybody's living life, eating, drinking, and doing whatever like it's no big deal, the time is right. The time is right for the Lord's return. And how does Jesus tell his disciples to respond? Knowing this to be true, notice what he says to them. Knowing that the time is right, knowing that I can return at any moment, notice the advice. He told them, chapter 18, verse 1, he told them a parable on the need for them to pray always. You see that? Present tense. That you are to pray now and you are to continue to pray and you are to never stop praying. That is the thrust of this passage. That is the thrust of this command. In light of all that's going on, in light of the Lord's return, he told them they needed to be faithful, to pray always, and not become discouraged. And I'm glad that's in there. Because often we pray and we do well, real well. We'll have seasons of prayer. We'll hear a sermon and we'll recommit ourselves to having a daily quiet time. You're going to hear this sermon today and you're going to leave here. And, you're, and I'm hoping that you make a renewed commitment to the Lord. That you're going, to be, uh, you're going to have a greater faithfulness to prayer than what you've had in times past. But you need to be careful not to become discouraged. 
Because we live in a culture that wants immediate results, don't we? We've got Happy Meals, and we've got microwaves, we've got fast food, we've got quicker internet, we've got all this stuff. You know why? Because we want it, you say it, we want it now. We don't want to wait. Even on the microwaves, you don't even have to put the number in anymore, you just push popcorn, right? <laughs> Takes too long to put that number in there, got no, I just push popcorn and it's good to go. And, and so that's the generation that we live in. We want it now. I don't want 3G. I want 4G. Is there another? Is there one greater than that? I, I have no idea. If there is, I have 4G. We need to upgrade. Okay? Okay, here's the thing. <laughs> but here's the point. Is you get the idea? We want results, and we want it now. And when we don't get results, and when we don't get it now, we get discouraged. And the Lord says, listen, I'm going to answer your prayer on my time. And I'm going to answer your prayer in my way. And I'm going to answer your praying in the way I see best. You don't need to get discouraged. You need to keep on praying. Keep on praying always. And as a matter of fact, present tense verb here, never stop praying. And also, when he says don't be discouraged, that's also in the present tense. In other words, I know that you, I know that, that it, discouragement is a reality, but you don't need to become discouraged right now, and you don't ever need to become discouraged. Just keep praying and trusting the Lord. That is how the Lord would have us to live in light of His return. One of the most important things that we can do as, as a church is to pray. One of the most important things that you can do as a father is to pray for your children. As a husband, is to pray for your wife and for your marriage. As a wife, the same for you. I, I pray for many of you. I prayed this morning for our church. Often when I go to a hospital and somebody's in a very critical position or condition, people will say, well, pastor, all we can do is pray. In other words, there's no other options. All we can do is pray. And everything inside of me says No. The best thing that we can do is pray. Amen? Come on, church. Let me hear you. Right? I say, come on, church. Let me hear you. Right? The best thing we can do is pray. Right? If you agree with that, say amen. amen. Clap a little bit. Okay. I guess I'm just going to have to ask for it if I want it. But here we go. The best thing that we, it should be the first thing we do. It should be the thing that we always do. And we should never leave praying. It was one man who says, you know what? I never close out my prayers with amen. Because I don't want ever want to stop praying. Right? Paul taught us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that in light of the Lord's return. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul talks about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. He, and, and, and then he says in the last part there of chapter 5, he says, pray without ceasing. And so we see Paul teaching the very same thing that Christ teaches here. In light of the Lord's return, pray. In light of the day of the coming of the Lord, pray without ceasing. Let's look at this parable. Um, the first thing that we see in this parable is how persistence is rewarded by a sinful judge. How persistence is rewarded by a sinful judge. Notice the reason for the woman's persistence. Verse 2. There was a judge in one town who didn't fear God. He's a sinful man. Or respect man. And a widow in that town kept coming to him saying, Give me justice against my adversary. Apparently there's someone who had treated this widow wrong. And so this widow comes to this unrighteous judge and she demands justice. Verse 4, For a while he was unwilling, but later he said to himself, even though I do not fear God or respect man, yet because this widow keeps pestering me. You ever had a cricket in your bedroom at night? Huh? You'll do as I do, right? You lay there and you hear that cricket and you'll think, well, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll give him that one. I heard him chirp. I'll give him that one and, and just hopefully he'll be quiet. And then he'll chirp again, and you're just laying there, and you're all comfortable, and you're thinking, well, I'll give him that one, but I'm not going to get up yet. And eventually what happens? That cricket just keeps on. And eventually what do you do? Because of the persistence of the chirping, what do you do? You respond. 
You get out of the bed, you hunt that cricket down, and you kill it. And no, you don't throw it outside, it might get back in. You kill it, all right? It's okay to kill crickets. Feed them to the frogs, right? <laughs> okay, some of you got that, some of you did. And so this woman, she, she wants justice. The judge will not give her justice. So what does she do? She keeps coming. She keeps on coming to the judge. She keeps on coming. She keeps persisting justice. She's very persistent. The judge even says, she's pestering me. He says, I will give her justice, he says, so she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. And so we see there, we see there the, the, the sinful judge rewards the persistent woman. And now we have, uh, not a sinful judge, but now we have the sovereign judge in verse 6. Then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him? Look here. This is talking about prayer, who cry out to him day and night. Jesus is teaching about persistent prayer, who cry out to him day and night. Will he delay to help them? I tell you, he will swiftly grant them justice. So what we have in the first part of the parable is a sinful judge who grants the request of a persistent widow. And what we have is a contrast. Notice what Jesus is saying here. Jesus says, listen, if a sinful judge who doesn't fear God and who doesn't fear man, if he'll grant the request of this widow, how much more will your loving father grant your request? Now listen, he's not teaching us that persistent prayer is pestering. That's not what he's saying. He's telling us, if that sinful judge is willing to grant her, yes, he considered it pestering, and he did it. His motives may not have been right, but yet, because of her persistence, he granted her request. How much more is your heavenly Father who loves you? You are his chosen, his adopted, the very ones he sent his son to die for. How much more will he grant your persistent praying. He even tells us here in this passage, he says, he will not delay to help them. I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Some of you say, well, pastor, I've been praying for the, the salvation of my husband for many years. And it hasn't been swift. First of all, God is the one who determines what swift is not you. And that's not to be ugly. That's just to be real, okay? You keep praying. God's the one who determines what swift is. And who's to say that, that God has not already heard your prayer and is sending you an answer, but yet there's something going on in the spiritual realm that you don't know about? I mean, we have accounts in Scripture do you remember Daniel who knelt down to pray? And at the very moment that Daniel knelt down to pray, God heard him and God sent an angel to, answer, to, to send him the message. But he didn't receive the message until some time later. And the angel comes to Daniel and says, Listen, the Lord heard you at the moment you begin to pray. Your prayer came before the Lord and he sent me as a messenger. But I have been what? I have been in a battle. And I've just been able to get it to you now. I don't understand how all that works. But I know that when we pray biblically, and I want to preface that, when we pray biblically according to the will of God as reflected in Scripture, then we can trust and believe that the Lord hears and the Lord will answer in His timing and in His way. What I want to encourage you with this morning is not to become discouraged, but to remain faithful in persistent prayer. Persistent prayer is a powerful weapon in the hands of a righteous believer. I want to share with you, 
share with you, and this is your outline, I want to share with you four, four reasons we should pray with persistence. Number one, because persistent prayer promotes God's agenda. Did you hear that? Persistent prayer promotes God's agenda. If we look at the context of Jesus' parable, Jesus is talking about the coming, his coming. And then he says, in light of his coming, you need to pray. It is God's agenda to send Christ a second time. And for Christ to rule and to reign upon this earth. And so when I pray, and this is how Jesus taught us to pray, when he says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, right? So when I pray with persistence, and, my, and I'm praying biblically, then I'm praying for God's agenda. I'm praying for God's agenda to be promoted. This morning in my office before I came out here, I prayed, God, I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase. I prayed that they would not see the messenger, but look beyond the messenger to the message. That they would not leave here today talking about Blake, but leave here today talking about Jesus. You see, I pray that with persistence because I know that that prayer promotes God's agenda. I pray for lost people to be saved continually. There are people in my family who are lost. People who I, who I desire to see saved. And many of them I have been praying for as long as I've been saved. I have been praying for their salvation. And many of them have not come to faith in Christ yet. Many of them have rejected the gospel. Many of them think they have no need of the gospel. But I continue to pray. I continue to ask God to save them. Why? Because I know that it is within, within the agenda of God to see the lost converted. So when I pray, I'm not praying for my kingdom to come, for my will to be done. I'm praying for his kingdom to come and for his will to be done. And I want to know my Bible. I want to study my Bible because I want to make sure that my prayers are biblical because I want to promote what God's doing, not what Blake wants to do. Does that make sense? So when I pray biblically and I pray with persistence, I promote God's agenda. God and His sovereignty. He doesn't need us. He spoke the world into existence when we weren't even there. But He has chosen to use our prayers as the means of accomplishing His redemptive plan. Did you, did you hear that? He has chosen... To use your prayers as the means of accomplishing his redemptive, prayer, his, his redemptive plan. Listen, he could save your lost husband without you. He could save your lost child without you. He is sovereign. He's om, omnipotent. He's all-powerful. But he's chosen to use your praying as the means of accomplishing that. So don't become discouraged when you're praying for classmates who are lost. When you have friends that you deeply care about and you know that they have no desire for the things of God. Or maybe they say they're saved, but yet they're not living it, right? And so you're praying for them. Don't become discouraged. You keep praying for your friends. Keep praying for your classmates. Keep praying for those college students. Keep praying for those people in your family. Keep praying so that you can promote God's agenda. God is not limited to our praying, but God has chosen to use our prayers. Number two, persistent prayer prepares God's child. It prepares you. I don't pray to change God. You understand? I don't pray to change God. God's immutable. He's unchangeable. I pray to change me. <laughs> I need my heart aligned with God's heart. God knows what's going on. God knows what's best. I don't. Anybody else? And if you're anything like me, if I don't pray as I should, I come up with some really good ideas that are born in the flesh. Anybody else? I've got some really good ideas that are born in the flesh. And I can even make, I can even make it sound like that my motives are right. And by nature, if we're not careful, that's what we're prone to do. 
We're prone by nature to be self-sufficient. We're prone by nature to give in to the desires of our flesh and to promote our own agenda. So it's important that I pray because I don't want to promote my own agenda. I want to promote His. It's important that I pray because I want my heart aligned with God's heart. Amen? So God, so persistent praying prepares God's child to be a part of what God is doing. I want to be in the center of God's will. I want to be used by God to advance the gospel. I want to be used by the Lord to glorify His name. I want to be used by the Lord to give you wise counsel. I want to be, I want to be used by the Lord to lead this church according to His will. Well, listen, if I'm going to be able to do that, I need to be persistent in praying because my heart is deceitfully wicked above all things and my heart is prone to stray. And so I need to pray and get in the throne room of God, not to change God, not to get God on my agenda, but in order to change me and to align my heart with his heart and to get me on God's agenda. Amen? Praise the Lord. Uh, number three, persistent prayer produces God's results. I mean, why pray persistently? Because God answers prayer. <laughs> Amen. That's good, isn't it? To know that God, that prayer works. God answers prayer. Now, he answers prayer according to his agenda. And he answers prayer according to his word. And he answers prayer according to his will. And if you are his elect, if you are his child, according to what Christ says here, if you are his child, listen, then he answers prayer according to what's best for you. And let's be real honest. We don't know what's best for us sometimes, do we? And there's often times we pray for things that really, if, if God answered, they would be harmful for us. And so there's times we pray for things and God says no. And there's other times we pray for things and God says not yet. And there's other times that we pray for things and God says yes. And you say, well, if he says yes, I know it's according to the word of God. How come I haven't experienced it swiftly? Well, he determines swiftly. And again, maybe there's something going on in the spiritual realm that you don't know, nothing, that you don't know about. Don't, don't fret about things that are outside of your control. You just keep praying. And you keep trusting the Lord and don't become discouraged. Prayer results, prayer uh, brings results, produces results. I still believe God heals. There's been all, oftentimes during I've, in, I've invitation, I've said, you know, listen, if you need, if you're struggling with a sickness and you need prayer for healing, then come down during the invitation. The invitation's not just for people to get saved. Amen? Amen. And some of you have come. But it's not just a time for people to get saved. It's a time for you to come forward and let us lay hands on you and to pray for, for, pray for God to heal you. We believe prayer works. And we believe that God still heals and God still does miracles. Now, often when it comes to healing, God says, no, I've got other plans for this person. Other times he says, wait. Other times he says, yes. Other times he says, I'm going to, sometimes he says, I'm going to do a miracle. and I'm going to heal that person right now. Other times he says, you know what? I'm going to use a doctor. I'm going to heal that person through a doctor. Or I'm going to use medication or I'm going to use surgery. Or the ultimate healing, you know what I've decided? This person is saved and what's best for this person is to come on to be in my presence. You see, because according to, uh, according to Psalms 139, our, our days were ordained before we ever took a step. And the Lord says, listen, you keep praying for this person's healing, but what you don't realize, it's time for them to be in my presence. Amen? Amen. Amen. And we experienced that this way with our, our good friend, Renee Dagnall, who usually sits right there. And he went home to be with the Lord this week. And, you know, we thought about that. There he was. He was unable to breathe underneath that car, and he, they died, and they brought him back to life. And, and there he was and with the ventilator and the ICU, and, and his eyes were open, but there was little brain activity. And, and we were praying for God to heal him. We were laying hands on him. We were praying for God to raise him up out of that bed, and we were praying for God to heal him. That's what we prayed for. 
but he never recovered. And he died. And he's in the presence of Jesus right now. So are we to say that God didn't answer our prayer? No, God knew what was best. We, we always pray for healing because I believe that we should always pray. God, God would want us to pray in that way. But at the end of the day, we pray for healing, but at the end of the day, we know that God knows what's best. Amen? So don't doubt the fact that prayer, prayer, still, still, prayer still produces results. Don't get discouraged. Well, I prayed for Brother Renee and he, and he didn't get healed. Or I prayed for this person and they didn't get healed. Or I prayed for that person and they didn't get healed. I'm just going to quit praying. I'm going to get discouraged. No. You keep praying. You keep trusting the Lord. You keep doing what you're supposed to do. And we're going to trust that God's going to do what he's supposed to do. Amen. And whether God chooses to heal them physically or here on earth or to take them home to glory, whatever God chooses to do, it's good. Amen. So persistent prayer produces results. Lastly, persistent prayer pleases God's heart. It pleases the Lord. I mean, that's enough right there, isn't it? Why should we pray with persistence? Because it honors God. It pleases Him. Do you know that? That when you kneel down or wherever you are, whatever position that you get in, and you pray, and you're serious about it, and let me tell you what I mean by being serious about it. Some people treat prayer like the national anthem at a football game. Are you with me? When you go to a football game or a basketball game, what do we, what do we always do? We sing the national anthem. Now, does the national anthem really have anything to do with the football game? Does it really have anything to do with the basketball game? It really doesn't. It's not a part of the game at all. So why do we do that? Why do we sing the national anthem? It's an act of courtesy, isn't it? And some people do that with their prayer life. They really, prayer is really not a part of their life. It's just an act of courtesy. It's just something they do because they know they're supposed to do it. That's not serious praying. That type of praying won't accomplish anything. I'm not talking about courtesy praying. I'm talking about persistent praying before God. It produces results and it pleases his heart. This morning, as you, as you evaluate your prayer life, where are you? Are you a serious prayer warrior? Is your life, is your life characterized by persistent praying? Or would you say, you know what? Pastor, here lately, my prayers have been kind of like the national anthem. Nothing more than a courtesy to God. If that's true, would you be honest and would you make a renewed commitment this morning that you're going to come back to a place of prayer where prayer is a priority, where prayer is not something that's casual to you, but prayer is a daily, consistent part of your life? We have a lot of things that are going on in this church right now. We're talking about launching a new campus in September. We have an evangelism strategy that we're going to be uh, implementing here soon. We have mission trips that we're taking. We've got a lot of things that are going on, a lot of things that will be happening in the future. We want to reach this city with the gospel. We want to multiply. Listen, it's not going to happen. God's not going to honor it if we don't pray. And we're not going to know what God wants us to do if we're not on our face praying. So we need every, every pastor, every connection group leader, Every department leader, every Christian who's a part of this church, we need you to be committed to pray. I will conclude by saying this. The only way you have access to God in prayer is through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you harbor iniquity in your heart, God will not hear your prayer. You need to be forgiven. You need to be saved. The Bible tells us that, that we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. Because of our sin, we deserve hell. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. 
The Bible tells us that even though we're a sinner, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the Bible says, listen, we've all sinned. We all deserve hell. But God sent his son, Jesus, to die in our place. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For the gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ came, was crucified, buried, and resurrected. And in order for anyone to be saved, they must believe and receive the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, confessing that you are a sinner, surrendering your life to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Has that ever taken place in your life? Have you ever come to that point in time in your life where you say, God, I'm a sinner and I know I need to be saved. And today I receive the gospel. I believe upon the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and I need your salvation and I commit my life to live for you. We want to give you that opportunity this morning during this time of invitation for you to come and for you to give your life to Jesus and be saved. Others of you to come and ask God to give you the power and the grace to renew your commitment to powerful, effective praying. Heavenly Father, we pray for a powerful move of your spirit during this time of invitation. Cause us to respond in humility, renouncing pride for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you begin to stand and come now as the Lord leads? Would you begin to come?